Ni Hao, Ho Chao, Sandy Kemper, and I will speak to you a little bit about the market that we built. On, on any given day, around the world, there are 42 to 43 trillion dollars of accounts receivable or accounts payable on the books of businesses. This is because there is roughly 250 to 260 trillion dollars of trade between businesses in the course of a year globally. Banks, some of whom are in the room, uh, some of whom are, would like to be in the room, finance two to three trillion dollars of the 42 to 43 trillion. We built a marketplace called CFO to take care of the rest. But before we uh, go too far into the company, one of the key things I've found as time goes by is to create common ties between a speaker and the audience. This is my pandering attempt to create a common tie for us. <laughs> he pitched uh, two nights ago in Kansas City, where uh, my family was. We have, we have seats right here. And I was in Hong Kong, so I could not see this great picture pitch for my team in Kansas City. But he won the ninth inning for us. The Royals went on to win the game. And I want to say shit uh, shit for uh, this wonderful addition to the Kansas City team. As you might have guessed, uh, yes, jeans, cowboy boots, I, uh, I am in Kansas City. That's why I get to go to those Royals games. Uh, and I do live on a ranch. I raise horses and sheep and chickens and, uh, and children. We have, uh, we have four children. Kansas City, some of you might know, was the jumping off point for all of the Western expansion in the United States. Kansas City was the place of origin for the California, the Oregon, and the Santa Fe Trails. It was the place of the Pony Express. I come from a long line of bankers. I was the fifth generation of my family to be in banking. Though I was always a bit of a black sheep, and I'll tell you more about that later. But that, uh, that, that history of banking supplied the Overland traders. So my family's bank made the loans to the men and the women and families who went on to establish Colorado and California. The bank that I was CEO of and chairman of before I left to do startups at that time was the largest bank in the United States west of the Mississippi. Los Angeles didn't exist. San Francisco was barely a, a muddy port town. In fact, this bank, uh, at that time which was called Commerce Bank, uh, gave the loan to Giannini, the Stark Bank of Italy, which some of you may now know as Bank of America. So when Giannini came here to establish his financial operation, uh, my great-grandfather gave him a loan to get started. When Henry Ford built his cars, the banks wouldn't advance money against the cars. No bank would loan on this new thing called an automobile. And Henry Ford called that same that same entrepreneur, W.T. Kemper, to ask if his son, Rufus Crosby Kemper, would be one of the first bankers to loan on cars. So I come from a, a history of banking and a history of, of commerce and support. Uh, and it's also a history, I believe, uh, very much shared in more, in more greater uh, historical reference with your fine country. Taipei and Kansas City, very similar in size, focused on manufacturing and high-tech manufacturing. In fact, one of the great high-tech manufacturing companies in Kansas City is run by someone who is Taiwanese, uh, Chairman Min Kao, who uh, started a company called Garmin, and that's located in Kansas City. So we have strong ties, we have a reliance on manufacturing, high-tech manufacturing, and we have a preponderance of small and mid-sized businesses in Kansas City, just as you do also throughout Taiwan. And just as Kansas City was important to the Western expansion, as you know better than I, your forebears established most of the trade and most of the language. In fact, the, the proto-language of the Austronesian people from all around Asia and Australia traces its roots back 10,000 years ago to this very island, as you all know. 
So we share in common the desire to explore, to create trade, and uh, I'm delighted to be here to find more common ties between Kansas City and uh, Taipei between the Midwest, United States, and Taiwan. But before I tell you a little bit about the company, uh, there's always there's always a story, I think, for most entrepreneurs when when the cobwebs clear and uh, and maybe you have a moment of intelligence. And uh, I used to be a banker, as I said, I left in 2000 to go build startup companies. This is my sixth. And uh, this this idea of the CQFO came when I was running another company during a very hard time, a very hard economic time in the early 2000s. And we were very fortunate, this company that I built with my team, we had a number of very good customers. We had big, big companies doing business with us. But they were slow to pay. And we didn't have any cash to finance the accounts receivable that we had on our books. So one morning, my, my uh, CFO came to see me. He came into my office. Actually, I didn't have an office back then. I sat at the desk. Uh, and he said, uh, we're, we're going to miss payroll. I said, how is it possible we're going to miss payroll? We have 100 of the Fortune 500 doing business with us. We employ 500 people. We're, what do you mean we're going to miss payroll? So, well, some of the clients have not paid us on time. So I called, well, I couldn't, I couldn't get any money from venture capital. There was no venture capital left, because this was 2001, 2002. I couldn't go to a bank, because we weren't really making that much money. We were just a startup. So I went to the only place there was cash, and that was the books of the businesses who were our customers. And I called, I still remember to this day, I called Tom Rosano, who was a friend of mine and a client at ITT. And I said, Tom, how's everything going at your business? He asked me how everything was going at my business, and I lied, and I said, fine. Uh, he said, so what can I do for you? And I said, well, look, you know, you owe us, you owe us uh, $1.2 million of accounts payable on your books, $1.2 million of accounts receivable on my books. Could you pay me early? Well, what, why? And, you know, I didn't tell him it was payable. Uh, but I said, just, it would be great. We've got some investments we need to make. And Tom said, yeah, let me talk to the finance guys. And he went back and talked to the finance guys. He called me back about 30 minutes later and said, yeah, Kemper, we'll pay you early. Uh, it's okay if we pay you $1,150,000. And I said, yes. Yes, it is so wonderful that you're going to pay this to me. I would have taken $800,000. And I needed that cash so bad. So that was the moment when I realized that there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way to design the flow of financing between those with cash and those who need cash. Traditionally, we in the banking business have always inserted ourselves as an intermediary between that bilateral relationship. That's a problem, not a solution. The introduction of an intermediary into a bilateral trade relationship creates uncertainty, creates risk, and inefficiency. Because to that buyer, to Costco, or to uh, Amazon, all of whom are clients of ours, there is no credit risk when that buyer pays the supplier early if the buyer is paying off of an approved invoice. So quick, what you do? You go to the market, you think about an efficient market for price discovery between two trading partners around something that they both need. The supplier needs cash, and the buyer wants what? More income, more gross profit. So if he can pay less for what he's already ordered, but pay it sooner, and that rate, that yield is better than what he's getting on his excess cash at a financial institution, he wins, or she wins. And the supplier, if the supplier can tap a market to fund themselves less expensively than they can from financial institutions that are more traditional, then the supplier wins. But really, we're not just we're not just about this idea of, of disrupting banks. That's not, that's not that interesting. I said before, two to three trillion dollars of working capital finance provided by banks in this world. Forty two to forty three trillion dollars of opportunity. Forty two to forty three trillion dollars of accounts receivable or accounts payable on the books of businesses on any given moment, any given day. 
and it's only getting bigger. There is no need, and this is where maybe this slide fits, there is no need for risk-based underwriting of working capital. It is a relic of a broken financial system. So how to solve? Build a marketplace that's easy, easy for suppliers to use, easy for buyers to, to put money into, at rates that work for both parties. This slide is a little bit more troubling. There are exactly four economies in the world with more than three trillion dollars of GDP. When you think about the cost today from this thing I call a relic of a broken financial system, the fact that we risk underwrite working capital, that we don't think about the bilateral nature of the obligation to create a more efficient clearing mechanism, this relic of a broken financial system costs the world's economy six trillion dollars a year. Businesses that can't access capital can't hire people. They can't produce product. Big companies that have excess cash, if you read the front page of the Financial Times today, you saw the largest money manager in the world feels that negative interest rates can put us further into depression. It didn't really work so well for Japan. Negative interest rates are not going to be the panacea that people expect them to be. But right now what they're doing is costing large corporations interest income. We met today with one of your companies this morning that has $20 billion U.S. cash on the balance sheet. They have yields of only 70 basis points, maybe 60 basis points. Meanwhile, their supply chain, when they borrow, are paying five, six, seven, eight, one thousand basis points. How do you create an arbitrage between the two? If you do it, and you solve the problem, whether we do it or someone else does it, or a coalition of marketplaces do it, you'll add back the fifth economy in the world generating more than three trillion dollars for the for the good of all of us. So what would it look like? I've already said we built a marketplace today. Not, uh, not unlike the New York Stock Exchange or uh, the, the Kayex or the NASDAQ Exchange. Just as they trade options and equities and bonds, we trade cash between trading partners. Our mandate, the reason we exist, is to liberate working capital globally. There's $42 trillion of working capital being held hostage today on balance sheets, behind bank shields, in poor returning and poor design investment vehicles that, that is costing those with cash and costing those without cash an immense amount of money. So what would that market look like? We went to market to find the very biggest companies we could get. Cisco, this is the food distributor in the United States, which we started in the United States, because that's where I, I, I grew up, where my connections were. Each one of those lines is a supplier to one of those in the middle. And as we began to build out the market, we noticed something really remarkable was happening, something we hadn't really quite anticipated. Suppliers to Amazon are also suppliers, of course, to Costco, to Macy's, to Nordstrom, to Mothercare, to whomever. Suppliers are supplying multiple buyers. So as our market grew, the coincidence of connectivity grew, and we began to see massive network effects. Uh, we now serve 100,000 businesses across 60 countries, 17 currencies, 17 languages. This is just a small sample of some of them. And how the suppliers connect, how the buyers' ecosystems overlap. When I left, when I left the bank in 2000 or 1999, my father didn't speak to me for six months. Uh, that's going back to the black sheep comment I made earlier. Uh, but the writing was on the wall. You know, when I was a kid, I, I, built, I built my forts before my dad would help me. I built my tree houses before my dad. I, I took my bike apart before I knew how to put it back together. I took his car apart before I knew how to put it together. I used to do uh, 
rocketry, you know, you make the rockets, you, you put the engines in, and they go up into the sky, little, little ones. I don't think you can do it anymore because it's too dangerous. Uh, but because of this, I had to make immense amounts of gunpowder. So as a 10-year-old, I would make pounds and pounds of gunpowder. And my parents never really seemed to notice. Uh, and it maybe was because I, they, they put me into the, this house had a bomb shelter, right? During the Cold War age, older houses in Kansas City were built with bomb shelters, complete with blast doors, and that was where I had my gunpowder storage. Uh, so he should have seen it come. He really should have known that I was not going to be a long-term banker. Uh, but yet, it was, uh, it was a difficult black sheep moment. So we built a marketplace, uh, despite everyone that said it couldn't be done. We did it in a way that allows suppliers, those who need cash, to name their own rate. That's, that's the, that was one of the aha moments. So we patented a process for price discovery in a marketplace. It would make no sense for there to be a utility pricing uh, mechanism for a share of IBM. It's worth about the same to all of us, whether you're buying because of a PE or a book or, or revenue multiple. When you're borrowing, you're borrowing at vastly different rates for vastly different reasons. So whatever marketplace you build, has to take into consideration the nuances of the heterogeneous nature of this thing called cash, which is usually a homogenous asset. So the consumption of this homogenous asset at heterogeneous rates, at spirit rates, is what we do and what we patent. And we did it in an electronic marketplace that today uh, is funding billions and billions of dollars of much needed cash to businesses who need it and generating hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of income for those who need income. And we did it by simply asking what if. Maybe taking apart as I was doing those bicycles and cars and hoping to have my moonshot. We took apart what we thought was a, a broken financial system and we redesigned it in a way that we think is better. And we did it from this little place in Kansas City and these are some of the numbers that, uh, that we're very proud of. When we started the company, back in March of 2010 was our first transaction, we have grown at a compound quarterly rate of 60% per quarter since we started. Uh, I don't, I mean, my guys and gals have told me, I forget what the, the total percentage is, but it's like, I don't know, it's too high. Uh, this is the one I'm most proud of. That's fine, $48 billion for the payments to that's and we've just begun, right? $48 billion of early transactions in a market that should be trillions, trillions, and trillions. So there's so much more yet to do. Uh, this is what's so important to suppliers. What do they care about? They care about getting their cash early. I don't want to wait 90 days, 120 days, 60 days. I don't even want 30 days. Pay me now. Let me make it work for you economically so you pay me now. So 198 million days of early payment. It's a half million years of early payment for suppliers. Think about the jobs that have been created, the products that have been made, the companies that have grown because of this. So whether it's Kansas City or Taiwan, take advantage of your unique resources. I heard one of the speakers say you don't have a lot of natural resources. This is not the natural age, ladies and gentlemen. This is the information age. Take advantage of your unique assets and resources. Build things on the things that you have. Build on the platform and the foundation of that which is great here. Great schools. Great work ethic. Great location. Great relationships and trade. A history that goes back 10,000 years in setting up trade across Asia. Our history in Kansas City already goes back to when my ranch was founded in 1830. I think that's my last slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good job.